struggling to move your nonprofit forward? You've come to the right place. Welcome to the Nonprofit Architect, where we are giving you the actionable steps you need to launch and grow your nonprofit organization. Now, here's your host, Travis Johnson. Hey, welcome to the show. I've got with me Jamie Weinfeld. Jamie, how are you today? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm doing great. We just finished up the longest pre-recorded interview uh, warm-up speech ever. We spent 40 minutes just chatting. And even though I've got nothing else scheduled today, I feel like we should probably start the recording. (laughs) Probably a good idea. (laughs) Jamie is a whiz in the event space. She doesn't just do events she produces them top bottom left for right does amazing things multiple locations galas community gatherings and she also does this through jw designs and she does work with roninchef.com uh, tell us a little bit more about what it is that you do jamie um so i have bounced between the event industry and theater world for as long as i can remember And in both of those spheres, it's all about producing a memorable experience. Um, So either for a patron at a theater event or for a client for a gala or a community celebration or even a private event like a wedding or an anniversary dinner. And all of those, I really work with all of my clients and my customers and my partners and the nonprofit organizations I work with to really create an experience that their guests will remember And as a nonprofit, that's so important because you want your guests to be able to come back and contribute and support your organization and be excited about what's to come in the future. Um, So building and telling your story, and in that case, even for a wedding, telling your love story or a nonprofit telling your story as a business um, is really at the core of what everything I do. It just happens to be under the framework of a theater or a nonprofit or a business. Now you talked about producing a memorable experience. When I think of uh, the kind of the carte blanche regular nonprofit events, I don't frame that with a memorable experience. So what does that look like different to like the standard nonprofit uh, fundraiser? It's thinking about your event a little differently and thinking outside of the box, thinking through the box, thinking in a way that allows you to connect your story with those of your audience. So having that personal connection, who is your one asking who is your audience? (laughs) And two, what are their expectations with interactions with you and exceeding those expectations? So yes, your event, let's say you're doing a basic nonprofit spaghetti dinner. Okay, your target audience is families. All right, they expect to show up, get a good meal and be on their way but how can we exceed that expectation to make it a memorable experience? Can we bring in a theme? Can we bring in outside vendors to create entertainment for the kids? So have a performance troupe come in, have a a theater group come in and do a little kid show, or can you partner with other food vendors to create it more of a carnival style so that they're not just coming in, sitting and leaving? How can you create that experience that goes above and beyond the expectations And if you go above and beyond the expectations, the likelihood of that audience member giving you more money during a fundraiser exponentially grows because they're absorbed in that experience and they're comfortable and they see the value of what they're paying for. And they're more likely to contribute towards that, not only during that event, but down the road because they had a great time and they tell their friends. And the fact that they tell their friends is free advertising for what you're going to do in a business or as a nonprofit. Um, So there's so many ways to be able to create that framework for all of your events by just following the guidelines of exceeding the expectations of your, your audience. Yeah. Well, I mean, word of mouth is, is what you want. You want that buzz. And if you need that buzz leading up to your event, uh, all the better. I know uh, we talked a few months ago and I've been throwing your name out there. You connected with one of uh, my former guest, Liam Klein at the Chaotic Spider Foundation. You coordinated with uh, Lisa Beth to create a virtual event that's going to go down in May. What is that? What does that look like? It's a little bit, it's, you're not a standard event. I wanted to bring it up. What is that event going to be? Yeah. Um, so I don't want to spill all the beans because it hasn't been officially announced just yet. So stay tuned for all the details or head to their website in the next couple months. And what I love about Chaotic Spider is their founder 
is so passionate and so excited, but also so connected to who he is and what he enjoys in life and isn't scared to say, you know what? I love this activity. I want to do it as a non uh, as an event for my nonprofit. I want to connect to the people that love the things I do, which I think is so important when you're producing an event, because if you love something as a business owner, I'm guessing at least some of your audience love that same thing too. And so they, he had a brilliant idea of last year wanting to do a fundraiser playing D and D he's an avid D and D player has a community. And he thought one day, how can I turn this into a fundraiser? Because I hang out with them once a week and they're my friends. And why can't we work these two things together? And they reached out to me because of course, during this unique time in this unique year, in-person fundraisers aren't necessarily the safest option, um, especially if they're in a closed space or a closed room. And so they reached out to me and said, hey, we have this brilliant idea and this creative plan to incorporate playing D&D into a fundraiser and how can we do it in a virtual world? And so that's what we're working on right now. So this will be a game night. So all you gamers out there, get excited. If you, especially if you love D&D and if you know nothing about D&D, which I actually don't at all, you can still participate because it'll, all the instructions will be given to you and it'll be such a cool experience. And we're going to have guest artists come in or guest talent come in or guest players, I guess, really, because we're playing D&D are going to come in. Um, we're going to have some speakers come in. So you're going to learn a little bit more about the organization as all fundraisers do. You need to know what you're fundraising for. Um, it'll be a great way to meet people from all over the world because the amazing thing about a virtual experience is you're not limited geographically. So you can invite people from all over the world. You can invite family from across the country and you can connect and meet with people in two different states during this event. Um, so it's going to be a ton of fun and it's going to be a fundraiser for such a good cause too. Um, so I'm so excited to partner with them and to be able to produce not only the marketing for the event, so to tell the world about it, but to be able to make sure it runs as smoothly as possible in the virtual world and for people to, to enjoy themselves and not be stressed out about, ooh, something's going to go wrong or Zoom is going to be weird since it will be all over Zoom which is my job as a planner for any event is to make sure you can enjoy the event and your audience and your guests can enjoy the event and you can reap the benefits afterwards as well. I love this. I, I do. I know I say that I love this just about every episode, but, but I, I do love this because you it, think about all the people that can't normally attend an in-person event just due to distance, due to time. And the first thing that popped up in my head, you know, thinking about this is you have family that is immunocompromised that can't go outside or they're in uh, some kind of assisted living facility and they just haven't been able to go do events in a long time. What a great way to get people involved in something like this. I had to bring this up because Amy Fazio from Magnify Your Mission brought me on to speak at her Magnify Your Mission collab and Lisa Beth. Uh, who's Liam Klein's mom was in there and I'm in there speaking and she brought me in to talk about automating your monthly donations, which I just love talking about. And it said, Lisa Beth, I was like, is this Lisa Beth Klein? She's like, oh, is this Travis? And then I hear Liam in the background and he uh, invites me to his fundraiser, even though I'm going to be, it was just, this is fantastic because I'm in Oklahoma. I think they're in Jersey. Uh, if I remember correctly. And but I'm in Pennsylvania. And you're in Pittsburgh, and I'm going to be in San Antonio in May at, at another event. And that evening, I'm going to hop on the Zoom to be part of this great fundraising event for the Chaotic Spatter Foundation. What a great way to do this. Like, I, I know some people are Zoomed out. I know some people are tired of being in this online space. But when you're done with the event, you just shut your computer off and you go wander into the kitchen and all of a sudden you're away from the event. There's not all this like, you know, I got to go get to the car, you know, say goodbyes, you got to get in and go. You're just, when you're done, good, bad, or indifferent, you can, or you can mute your camera and you can mute your video and you go take care of whatever you want to. What a, I, lo I love this. But, you know, when we talked the first time, you were talking about an event you did that was a theater experience that was in multiple locations. And you also had people watching online. Walk us through what that event was, what it looked like, and what kind of value you can really bring to an experience if you put it together well. 
Yeah, of course. So you're kind of mushing together two theater experiences I've done um, with the same company. One was in person before COVID. Um, and one was how we adapted to the virtual world we're in now, which are both very valuable. Um, so I'll do a little bit brief on what the first one was, so you can, which will then give value and explain how the second one happened. Um, so the first one is with the Shadow of the Run series, which is the theater company that was founded by a good friend of mine. And feel free to look them up online. They're an amazing immersive theater company. So immersive theater crash course is instead of sitting and watching a show or having actors walk around you, you are completely immersed in experience. So all five of your senses are interacted with. You can eat, you can drink. Uh, actors can interact with you physically, either by tapping you on the shoulder or there's a, a nice range of acceptable behavior depending on the production and releases and things like that. But all five of your senses are sound, there's light. You are moving through a space in most cases um, and either guided by an actor or an actress or allowed to just freely wander a space and experience the production that's happening around you. So that's an immersive theater. Um, that is m immersive theater. And what Shadow of the Run did um, is we have a script and we went to a historic town called Bedford, Ohio. And the script itself um, followed loosely the life of the first murder victim of the torso murder of the 1920s, 30s, and 40s in downtown Cleveland. It's a historical true crime. Ours was inspired by that historical event. And what it was is we had five different locations in downtown Bedford that at any given time had five different scenes happening. And we had audience members entering this experience every 20 minutes and then being escorted into these five different spaces. So at any given time, there was about 25 scenes happening and 25 different audience members experiencing 25 different moments in the script. And the entire experience was an hour and a half long. And so at the end, all the audience members, and there was 14 in each time slot moving through at the end, they had to all talk to each other to get the whole story. And no two experiences were alike, which was an amazing conversation starter because someone would be like, Oh, did you see this? Or Oh, I saw I saw her, I saw him, or did you see the butcher? I don't know. Did you see the murder? And it was, they had to solve the problem and the story. Um, and there really was no solving because it was left open, open aired at the end intentionally. It was designed to be a conversation starter and designed to immerse you in that world. And then COVID happened. And so you can't necessarily smush 25 people into 25 small rooms across five different buildings. That's um, pretty fun. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably not the safest, safest space, especially in some of those buildings, there was no air conditioning or outside air because they were historic buildings. So not the best option right now. So we adapted and we adapted by pulling the elements from that first show of the audience interaction of that one in one moments with those actors that the audience absolutely loved um, and made them personally connected to the story because they made friends with an actor or a character and they got to know a little tidbit that nobody else knew that they secretly could either hold or share with other people. So we adapted that and created just a one-off script. Um, we created a 30 minute experience because again, Zoom fatigue is a thing. <laughs> people are on Zoom all day and you need to respect that and give them an experience that doesn't require them to stay longer than they feel comfortable with. So our experience was about 30 to 40 minutes long. And it was based on the framework of a book club. So it was placed modern day. And I had four actors, actually five actors that came into the experience. And our audience members didn't necessarily know who the actors were. And there was a script. However, the whole point was to get the audience members to interact and guide the storyline. So our actors were trained to ad lib a lot of the script and to intentionally ask specific questions to audience members to get them, even if they were yes or no questions, they were still engaging each audience member. And the wonderful thing about Zoom is there's breakout rooms, which means you can have a one-on-one -on -one with an actor just like you would in real, real life. And so we had four different one-on-one -on -one experiences. So four different random or five, depending on how many audience members we had at any given time, were 
taken to a breakout room with a specific actor, given an experience, a one-on-one experience, and then brought back into the space. And they could either share what happened in that breakout room or they could keep it to themselves. I, as the stage man- virtual stage manager, could not see what was happening in this breakout room. So that really was an exclusive experience. And it was amazing to see how the audience just opened up after they came out of those rooms because they had that comfort level with that actress or that character. And when they came back, they had that special moment to share and really felt connected and really felt affected when something happened to that character in the show, which was quite fun to see by the end of the experience. Um, So there's so many ways to use Zoom to adapt and to connect with your audience, which is the goal of everything that we do um, and Zoom or other virtual platforms to produce an experience that is memorable that people came back for. We had multiple people buy multiple tickets for different nights because every night was slightly different. Um, Some would come in and be really quiet the first time, get the lay of the land and then come back and just be as creative and punchy and engaged as possible and try to throw the show off script just because they could. Um, or they be a, bring a friend and get the friend like wrapped into the storyline because they kind of knew what was going to happen next. But again, it was different for every audience member and every show that we did. So keep that in mind when you're producing an experience. Think outside of the box. Use the tools you have. And we sold out our show three times over and had to extend it twice because it worked. <laughs> this is the, like the coolest possible event I think I've ever heard of is what you're just describing. And I, I have a lot of questions, Jamie. You're leaving me over here. Questions. Like if I am a nonprofit that has maybe done an event or two or not, how do I put something together? Like what you're talking about, of course, you know, just call Jamie and, and she'll send it to you. But like, how would you go about approaching something so in depth and, Is it as complex as I think it is? It can be. Um, I, and this isn't meant to be a self plug, but I highly encourage you to reach out to a professional that's done this before, somebody in the theater community that's familiar with virtual productions or a special event professional. Feel free to contact me. I'll answer your questions or we can work together official capacity. I'm always open to questions or consultations are free. Because there are some technical aspects that will make or break your experience with Zoom and also allow you to be able to interact the way you would like to, especially as a host, um, if you're doing a fundraiser or as somebody that's doing a workshop or an educational event with constituents or with your clients or with your patrons or guests. Having that freedom to not have to worry about the technical side really makes a difference. Um, I've done a few events and been involved with a few events that haven't had that technical support and just kind of let's try it. And it was stressful for everybody involved and your audience can assess that stress. And they've been on Zoom all day. They know Zoom glitches. They know stuff happens. But really, if you want your event to be polished and your guests to not be interrupted by a tech issue constantly happening, then I really highly recommend reaching out to a professional to just provide guidance. Um, And the first thing that comes to mind is if you're producing an experience and any experience, one, think of just a creative idea and grow from it, doing brainstorming sessions, reaching out to your resources, talking it over. And once you've settled on, okay, this is the goal of our event. This is the audience I want to interact with. This is the platform I want to use, be it Zoom or an in-person or a hybrid event. Now that we've got the basic floor plan, excuse me, for the event, how do we actualize actualize it? And how do we then step into the technical world um, for an in-person event that is connecting with an event planner, that is connecting with an event manager so that will be there the day of so that your vendors talk to each other and so that everybody's where they need to be on time and food is out when it's supposed to be, or your speaker is ready at the podium or the sound cues are set for your slideshow so that all of that stuff is there and in place. The same is true for a technical experience. So you work with an event planner, be it somebody on your team that wants to be the tech person or the manager of that experience or somebody that really likes Zoom and is totally okay with pushing all the buttons. But having a tech person, their sole job is to make sure those technical things happen 
in the right time and at the right moment is so very important for your experience to be successful and for your audience to be able to be fully engaged from start to finish. And another step towards that is always keeping your audience in mind and in a technical world that's giving them all the tools they need right up front. So presenting them, have a host say, hey, welcome to the experience. Give a moment for your audience to work with the tech tool you're using. So saying, hey, we're on Zoom. This is how you mute and unmute. This is the rundown of the experience you're about to have. So give setting your guests up for success so that they know what's going to happen and they can focus on that experience and focus on enjoying it. Working from idea um, all the way through your actual event and it happening in person is working from just kind of the fun, the exciting stuff, working through the nitty gritty, having that technical support laid up um, or set up, having a tech rehearsal, <laughs> um, just like a dress rehearsal for a theatrical production, a tech rehearsal is very important for any show. So bring some friends in, run through your script, share all of your media in your tech rehearsal, and then having it for your event itself. And being able to use all the tools that Zoom has or the platform that you're using. Zoom has breakout rooms. Zoom has time limits. So you can make sure people don't hang out for an extended amount of time. Zoom has um, ways to do like question and answer and ways for people to respond and engage without necessarily unmuting themselves. There's ways to share audio without sharing video, but you can also share video with no audio. So there's lots of tools you can use to really customize that experience, um, either in an educational event, a nonprofit fundraiser, or a business meeting, or just a theatrical social experience. That is a lot, but I think it's, it's worth doing. So many nonprofits that I talk to and interact with, and this may not be, if you're listening to this, you may be like, Travis, that's not my experience. So many that I talk to, they're, they're kind of risk adverse. So they're, they're wanting to do the same thing that they did last year, not because it's the best thing to do, but because they've already done it and it's easy. And those things are not going to get you noticed. They're not going to get you paid. They're not going to give you a record breaking uh, fundraising year doing the same old stuff. Now, is there ways to do things and there's there ways to uh, have interactions and there's obviously ways to jazz up what you are doing. But if you're a nonprofit later and you're staring down doing the same thing that you did last year or the last five years or the last 15 years, do your supporters a favor and don't have them already regretting walking into the door before they get there. Oh, it's just going to be this thing rubber chicken. Oh, I'm going to hear the same uh, founding, you know, origin story that I've heard the last six times. Oh, I'm going to hear from the same. Don't do that to your people. Do you want to go to that event? You don't want to go to that event. Make an event that people want to go to. They're going to talk about afterwards that is going to sell out Week after week, if you're doing something like a theater production, that you have to extend the run because it's so exciting that people want to get in there and do it. Exactly. And and to even expand upon that is you don't have to spend a ton of money. You can do, there's so many creative options out there to create a cutting edge and fun and exciting event virtually in person or a hybrid that connects with your audience members that personalize it to their needs and their and then exceeds their expectations without breaking the bank. So just thinking outside the box and getting creative does not mean that your fundraiser will break the bank and make you spend more money to produce it than it will bring in. Yeah, assembling the right team, having the right people, having the right vision is going to go a lot further than hiring this company, hiring that company, spending more money. We've talked about this great experience that you've put together, uh, which is just phenomenal. We've talked about the Chaotic Spire Foundation and D and D, what that's going to look like. Tell me about a train wreck that you've been involved in that just did not go as planned. You know, leave out names, leave out the organization, but what was the event and just why was it so awful? Oh gosh, was, <laughs> that's kind of the other other thing is don't be scared. And I know you mentioned being risk averse. Don't be scared to try something new. If it fails, it fails and you learn from it and you try again. I've planned events. I've, and 
wasn't necessarily a fundraising event. It was a membership night. So a membership drive, which can also happen in nonprofits. You have members, you want new members to bring new members on board, not just financially, but being able to participate, engage with your subscription, if you're a theater or your series, if you're a production company of some sort or produce educational something. And we planned, an, um, I was working with a nonprofit and we planned a membership night and it was fun. And we had a taco bar and we had games and we had rented a venue and the decorations were spot on. And we had like 25 people show up, which was not, which would barely cover our costs. And it was really frustrating <laughs> and really we were bummed out about it. But after the fact, we looked at it and said, okay. In previous years, this has been a well-received event. What did we do differently this year? And why was this year different than what we had done in the past? Had we just repeated the same thing and hoping that it would be successful because we've always done it, which was also the case? Did we have other events that were too close to this event that contributed towards kind of oversaturating our audience? Was this event advertised correctly? So we explored all of the options and realized that a lot of it was that one or we hadn't advertised as we had in years past, which was frustrating because of course, as nonprofits, you kind of expect people to get excited when you get excited. But if you don't tell people and don't give them the right tools and don't at, connect socially, virtually word of mouth about an event, people don't know about it. Um, so that was part of it. Um, it was really close to two other events that we had done that were well received. They were smaller events, but it was starting to oversaturate our audience. So they weren't as likely to come to this, even though this one came every year. The weather was a little bit of a factor because people had to travel to go to this event and it was bad weather that night, which you can't change. And that's just, it, it happens and you move on. Um, so there was a lot of factors involved and we learned from it, modified our schedule the following year. And while we have this event every year, we now know how to improve upon it and how to make it better. And the following year, when we produced the event, we sold out our tickets, we reached our goals, and we had a blast. And everybody's like, okay, we made it. <laughs> we got over that hump. <laughs> what I heard is that you oversaturated them with events, you didn't give them the lead time they needed for advertising. And those two things at a minimum are going to be very important. Oh, and then you, you collected feedback in the military. We call it an after action report. All right, people, what did we do? Why was it great? Why did it suck? What lessons did we learn? It doesn't have to be complicated, but the feedback is so necessary to making sure you can do it again the next year. If your you know, biggest donor walks in the door and you do something that upsets them to where they're going to pull their money, maybe you don't do that next year. You know, maybe you decide, hey, I don't think we need to have the the juggling flaming swords this year because someone might get hurt. So we'll try something different next year. So you had a couple of events, right, stacked up together. Were they fundraisers? Were they friend raisers? What kind of events were those that were stacked up? Yeah. Um, so in that case, it was a mix of fundraisers as well as a mix of just for that nonprofit. It actually was competition. So we were competing. Um, and so we were telling our friends, come see us perform, come see us in this concert, pretty much, or this competition, come see us do this. And so we were asking our audience and our friends and family to do so much in such a short amount of time and continually asking. And something in this relates directly to marketing as well as in person. If you continually ask somebody for something, they're going to tell you no, they're going to get annoyed by it. They're going to, it'll just wash over them versus interrupting that con like continual ask with information or an experience that's not one to ask at all. So something that's fun, that's social, that's giving back to the community. So you have to even out as a nonprofit, as a business, and especially in marketing, you can't continually do posts and you can't continually do events that are constant fundraisers that you show up, you give me money, you show up, you give me money. You have to be able to give back to those audiences and those guests and make them feel welcome and enjoyed and appreciated and giving them something in return for their support for you. And unfortunately, we had too many asks in a short amount of time. They were amazing and they were fun and we really wanted people to come and see us and come to these events. But 
every time it was, hey, you have to buy a ticket to see us in concert. Hey, you have to pay money to attend this event. That's our fundraiser and spend more money at that event. Hey, uh, we're doing another fundraiser that's small and online, but we still need your money. It's too much. Yeah. So we talked about Zoom fatigue and now we're talking about event fatigue. Earlier, well, my wife was here, she was talking about putting in one of those ring lights, but covering like the cul-de-sac. I was like, you want every single car, every dog, every person to get an alert on your phone? You're going to have alarm fatigue and you're ignoring, you're going to start ignoring the alarms that you would like to see because you just have uh, uh, too many of them. And we don't want that. Um, and then you mentioned the lead time for marketing for this event. What kind of lead time do you recommend for marketing for a, a big event? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it varies a little bit as to the type of event. So if you have a, a Zoom experience that's short, that's a couple hours, maybe a month in advance for marketing and really the two weeks before are the most important of your heavy hitters of every couple of days posting about the event for a larger event. So let's say a gala or a banquet, or especially if it's in person, you need to start advertising at least four to six weeks in advance um, and have your invitations go out at that time. Um, and I would think even before that start a kind of save the dates, teaser posts, personal notes to your big donors and your high ticket um, audience members and your um, sponsors to really start to infiltrate the neighborhood and the community and kind of the whisper, whisper, hey, something cool is coming. Hey, stand by. Hey, save the date. Um, because you want to have that growth of excitement. You want to give them teasers about this cool thing that's happening, especially if it's something that doesn't happen annually. Um, now, after time, the word of mouth, if it's an annual event that happens, let's say 4th of July every year, people know it's coming. You still should get excited about it and show how that event is different than years past. But the word of mouth is already there. But if it's something new, you definitely need to take that strategic time and know when you send your invitations out the framework of your event so that you're not changing that information. And yes, life happens, things need to change, especially right now, and you need to adapt. But giving your customers and your audience members a clear idea of what that event is from their invitation and consistently getting excited about that experience is so important because if you keep changing it, the value one of your experience will change because you're going to keep questioning the information that their your audience is going to be questioning the information they're getting. And two, it doesn't look very polished. It doesn't look very professional if you keep having to change last minute things. So planning ahead, really starting your planning at least six to eight months in advance if you're doing a big event so that you can get your ducks in order, get your team get your framework set up. And then in that time leading up to the event, fine tuning, building your support team, doing your tech rehearsals, finalizing your contracts with your vendors, finalizing your tablecloth colors or your guest speakers. Um, though, if you have guest speakers and you know, you're going to have guest speakers advertise that you're going to have guest speakers and just say, Hey, this is exciting. Come here. These amazing guest speakers details coming soon versus giving a list of guest speakers and then changing um, last minute, extensively changing that doesn't look very good and also confuses your audience. <laughs> uh, in, in my experience, why, why these details matter, why the last minute changes, all this stuff matters, looking polished, not necessarily like, I mean, there's a lot to be said for authenticity, but if you look like you're just bumbling and fumbling around, your fans and your donors are going to wonder that if they donate their money, is it going to be well taken care of? Are you going to be a good steward of the resources that they're providing? And if you give them reason to believe that you're not, they're not going to donate. Exactly. Exactly. And your event in the end, the more organized it is, the better your audience will enjoy it. And the more trustworthy they will be with the fact that they are donating money to you. Um, so having understanding that everything you produce as an organization from your first save the date to your teaser posts on social media, to your invitation, that consistency really 
shows that you know what you're doing and that you're going to follow through when somebody donates and you're going to follow through on the mission that you have as an organization. And there's so many free tools out there right now for marketing purposes to really have that polished look on social media, to really help with branding, to really help with invitations. There's so many resources now so that you don't have to spend so much money to try to make it look nice up front, especially for virtual worlds and doing for virtual and digital presence and social media presence. Um, Canva is one of them. I use it all the time. It's free version is really, really good. If you want to do it even better, you can do a paid version. Um, but if, yeah, if, Canva. You're following, if you're following me at all on social media and you see cool graphics and stuff that I put out, all of that is Canva and all of it's free. Like I had a friend do the digital like design for free and I use Canva for free to produce most of my stuff. She'd be like, Oh, I saw that little cool thing you did that was animated for like the holidays. Well, wow, you're great at graphic design. I have zero graphic design talent. They had a template. I put my logo on, changed the colors, and that's what you saw. And if you were impressed, ta-da, you can do impressive stuff too with Canva. Yeah, it's so cool. And I'm a graphic designer. I started understanding Photoshop and publisher and design through those tools. But Canva is such a wonderful source and makes my job as a graphic designer a thousand times easier <laughs> um, to be able to provide those products for people and to be able to work with them and, and or guide them if they want to use Canva personally and to be able to save them money. Absolutely. So... As we're wrapping up here, we've talked about a lot of great things in this episode. So much value. I'm really excited that you share with us how you do these uh, crazy immersive theater experiences. This is so cool. Uh, what else would you like to share with the audience, with the, our guests here today that uh, you haven't had the chance to say yet? I don't know if there's any one thing in particular. We kind of went a great arc over what I know how to do and what nonprofits really should be excited about and creatively working through this unusual time. And I know it's really frustrating some days to be in a nonprofit, especially right now, um, and having to grow and adapt into new technology and still connecting with our audiences. And there's just so much on everybody's plate. But I think we can take this time as nonprofits and as small business owners to reevaluate what we do and to work smarter and to be able to kind of step outside of our comfort zone and to be able to produce experiences that have a higher impact with one less upfront cost, <laughs> um, but two, a higher impact so that we don't have to work so hard in the long run. So if you do one or two huge events every year that are really high impact and everybody's excited about, you don't need to do necessarily 25 of small events that you're working your butt off to try to keep people engaged so thinking about the fact that you can do a high impact experience that really hits all the marks and is really well planned out, it will work better in the long run than if you're just struggling and having to catch up and having to try to race to do the next event and you just feel like you're always behind um, to really take that moment and that time to reevaluate how we're working through and that we're working more efficiently <laughs> than just always chasing after what we want. And that's one of the pillars here of the nonprofit architect is to get you to say no to more work and say yes to more money. So Jamie, where can people find you? Sure. You can find me on Facebook or Instagram at jamiewdesigns.com. Um, or you can check out my work with Ronan Chef at theroninchef.com. And Jamie is J-A-I-M-E. Thank you so much for being on the show today, Jamie. Can't wait till this thing goes live. Great. I'm excited and thank you for having me. You've been listening to The Nonprofit Architect. To listen to all our past shows, visit http colon forward slash forward slash nonprofitarchitect.org. And be sure to subscribe, rate, and review our show. Thank you.